Thank you all very much for coming. Can, can you hear me in the, in the back row? Excellent. It is a pretty frenetic period in life for all of us interested in climate change because Paris uh, COP21 starts uh, on uh, Sunday, Monday. And on Monday, 139 heads of state, prime ministers, presidents will be there. It's three minutes each, 139 of them do the sums. It's going to be uh, quite a day and who knows whether they'll keep them to time. I, I want to set the whole story in the context of climate change and how important the next 20 years will be. This next 20 years are absolutely fundamental to determining whether this is the best of centuries or the worst of centuries. It's an enormous responsibility that we, who are around doing the decision making, it's an enormous responsibility that we face, but it's full of opportunity. And it's full of opportunity of the Ashton kind, full of ideas, a potential for turning those ideas into something really substantial that changes the way we do things. So this is the right place to have that discussion of how we make this next 20 years transformative rather than sliding into something that's pretty unpleasant and locks us in to something unpleasant for a very long time. That's where I'll start. Then I'll say something about cities and the role they play in this. Absolutely central is the obvious uh, answer. And I'll be talking both about climate change and to some extent about uh, air pollution because uh, burning fossil fuels not only creates uh, greenhouse gases, it also um, spews pollutants into the atmosphere <laughs> which kill people now. If there's anything to say for CO2, it kills people, late, kills people a bit later than now, but it still does it on a massive scale. So it's very important to put those two things together in understanding the consequences of relying on fossil fuels to the extent we have and to the extent we still do in many uh, parts of uh, activity in many parts of the world. Finally, the last couple of slides I have will be about Paris, and I'll just open it up. I'm, I'm a bit deep into it. I've become a bit Paris nerdy on, on this. I'm uh, Ami Ducher and for Laurent Fabius, who's the uh, Foreign Minister of France, who's chair of the COP. And um, I'm on the strategy committee for the executive uh, secretary of the UNFCCC, Christiana Figueres. Um, I, I should say unpaid and unsupported in both those, uh, both those roles. So I'll say a little bit about Paris. And I think we can see what's likely to happen. Of course, we don't know for sure that it will. One of the problems with Paris is that you're looking for unanimity of 190 some countries. So when you get close to the end, you always get some grandstanding. People holding out for some particular bit of the story that they really want. And if you're the last one standing and you're the only one or two uh, blocking unanimity, you think you can get an awful lot by uh, being a bit hard and, and a bit ornery and a bit difficult. And in a lot of the cops, eventually somebody gavels you out, but you have to choose the moment where you gavel people out. So you're going to see this kind of theatre a bit at the end. So don't think that it's all falling apart just because that happens. Don't necessarily uh, deduce from a bit of grandstanding that nothing's going to happen, but you will see it right at the death. So let me move um, first then to the urgency and why these next uh, 20 years matter so much. That's the uh, layout of I've just described as the three parts of what I want to uh, say. So why are these next 20 years so critical? Well, first, we're right on the edge of the kinds of concentrations that allow us to hold to two degrees. Given our inability to act earlier and stronger, we're now at uh, concentrations of greenhouse gases around um, 400 parts per million CO2, close to 450 CO2 equivalent. And that's a, a measure of how much the greenhouse gases are in the atmosphere. And that concentration is on the borderline of holding to two degrees possible. The two degrees story is two degrees average global surface temperature above the second half of the 19th century before we really started going um, very strongly for fossil fuel um, driven growth. So that's the usual benchmark. We've been plus or minus one over the Holocene period uh, since we warmed up after the last ice age, which is the period during which our civilization developed. We turned the grasses into grains because we had the grains. We sat uh, stationary whilst the um, uh, 
the grains went from seeding to uh, harvest, we had a surplus, so you could have um, university teachers, TV programs and so on. That's, it's a very short period of time, it's seven or eight thousand years. But even Homo sapiens has been around only for 250,000 years. We haven't seen three degrees for about three million years. We haven't seen um, four or five degrees for tens of millions of years. So you can already see that the one degree that we're close to now is on the edge of the temperature range, the very narrow temperature range during which our civilization developed. Two degrees already very substantially outside what we've seen in that uh, Holocene period. Three degrees, not seen for three million years, way outside what uh, Homo sapiens has seen. We don't know exactly what will happen. Uh, it could it could and likely would rewrite the relationships between human beings and the planet in terms of where we could live, the nature of the lives and livelihoods that we could follow. At three degrees or so, probably much of southern Europe would look like the Sahara Desert. Big parts of Bangladesh would be underwater and so on. We can't say exactly what would happen, but we can say, I think, with great confidence that the risks are very large risks of hundreds of millions, perhaps billions of people having to move and as a result of that there being extended conflict, the reasons of which, for which you couldn't turn off. So the first thing is to understand very clearly the stakes that we're playing for and that we are at the limit of being able to hold to two degrees. The scientists point to two degrees because beyond two degrees, well A, of course it's, as I've observed it's already way outside what we've experienced in the Holocene period but uh, secondly, uh, above that, you, you run into risks of tipping points. I mean, a big one would be the thawing of the permafrost and the release of all that methane. Another one would be um, if the land ice sheets slid off. If major sliding off of those land ice sheets took, takes place, you'd see sea levels rise. It's going to be really hard from here. We shouldn't be starting from here, but it is just possible to have a decent chance of holding to two degrees. But we're really in a hurry. If we hesitate, we're going to be in deep trouble. At least we wouldn't be able to hold to two degrees. And not doing much, not accelerating, not moving quickly over the 20 years is what I mean by hesitating. Now there's a second reason that the next 20 years is so important, is that the world is moving into cities. We are about three and a half billion people in cities now. We will be six and a half billion in uh, the middle of the century. We'll move from 50% of a bit over 7 billion to 70% to somewhat over 9 billion. That's a pretty hard prediction as predictions go. You can see it doesn't assume very much. We know roughly what will happen to population and we can guess at the 50 to 70%. So that statement that we're going to add 3 billion or so to the 3.5 billion we've got in cities already is a pretty strong and clear thing to act on. That happens only once in human existence, that we have an increase like that. It's an incredible 30 or 40 years in human history. After that, you know, you're up to 70%, the fraction moving into cities starts to slow in its increase, and we know from the demography that the population increase will be likely to slow as well. We're dealing with a one-off event in human history over the next 30 or 40 years of immense importance. So it's very clear that how we design those cities is absolutely critical. Do we build cities which are ever more uh, sprawling, ever more dirty, ever more difficult to move around, where people carry on using cars uh, whenever they like, driven by uh, hydrocarbons, so you get more and more Mexico cities and so on. Do we want to, well the answer to that is clearly we don't want to, but will we go on like that? or will we find some way of doing things very differently? That's, and of course that's going to be shaped in the next 20 years in very large measure. This is an amazing 20 years. It's a huge responsibility, huge opportunity. We should be daunted, but we should also rise to it. And the Ashton Trust is one of the ways, kinds of ways in which we can rise to this challenge. So I'm putting an awful lot on all our shoulders. It's not me that's invented this. The concentrations are what the concentrations are and the movement into the cities are what they're going to be. So handling that well is incredibly important and it's not for some abstract future generations. My grandchildren, five of them, age 0 to 4, 
It's, the, it, it's those people. Those people are going to see the big stuff. People at my age won't see the big stuff. I mean, big stuff, I mean potentially three or four, five degrees if we get it wrong. But they would if we got it wrong. They would see it. It's their lifetimes. It's not some abstraction of future generations. So that's the story. And it's a big part of really what I wanted to say today. So I packed that into the introduction, if you like, but that's essentially the storyline. Given the rather difficult position into which we've got ourselves, how do we move forward? What kinds of targets are we going to have to think about if we're going to be able to hold a reasonable chance of holding to two degrees? Well, first we have to look at what um, has been promised in COP21 in Paris. For 2030, countries around the world, now over 170, a great success in itself that we should recognise and celebrate, have put on the table where they think they'll be in 2030, having made an effort to cut their greenhouse emis emissions. So their plans are a lot less than some notion of business as usual, but they will go from about 50 billion tonnes a year CO2 equivalent emissions now to about 55 in 2030. It's only, these are estimates because some of the ambitions are related to emissions per unit of output, so they're specified in terms of that parameter, so you can't, you can't extrapolate without some guess at what their growth rate is going to be. But roughly speaking, a few of us have done the calculations, including my self and colleagues at the LSE, it looks around 55 billion tonnes, the promises for 2030, or the intentions for 2030. That's a 10% increase. A two degree path sensibly planned from here would be about a 20% decrease in those 15 years. So we're going to be up substantially for 15 years on where we should be if we were following a sensible two degree path from now. It means we're going to have to accelerate very strongly after 2030 and indeed do our best to ramp up ambitions for 2030 which are currently articulated. And a big part of the story of the next few years will be how do you ramp up those ambitions? How do you give people the confidence that they can actually do better than the intentions, the 2030, they've put on the table. They can do a lot better. I've looked very closely at the Chinese ambitions. They say they'll peak emissions in 2030. I think they could surely peak them in 2025 and probably a good deal earlier than that. So the story is how we work as a world to ramp up that ambition. But in any case, because of how high we are now, and it's still going to rise for a bit, we're going to have to go, if we're to achieve a reasonable chance of two degrees, something close to zero or indeed negative before the end of the century. That's going to be hard. It's not impossible, but it's going to be really hard. The higher we are in the next 15 years, the tougher the fall after 2030 is going to have to be. So that's, uh, that's the story. And remember that the calculations of how much you can emit is really uh, not something which is a year-by-year -year basis, what the scientists rightly tell us, because this is about the concentrations of greenhouse gases, is that the total amount that we can emit and still have a reasonable chance of holding two, de two degrees is this much. So the more you do at the beginning, the less you're going to have to do later. And actually, if you look at this much, which is the amount we can emit, and compare it with the CO2 that would arise from burning the reserves of hydrocarbons that we know about, you come to the conclusion that many people have articulated that uh, you couldn't burn, depending on the probability of holding to two degrees that you look for, you couldn't burn more than half of what we already know about, let alone what people are already looking for. So what I've just said, of course, it involves uh, leaving a lot of it in the ground. I've already said that the cities are in the middle of this story. About 75% of the emissions come from cities. Uh, associated with about 75% of output coming from cities, only just over 50% of the uh, population. But as I've already argued, that's going up very strongly. So if you start at 75% of the emissions coming from cities, and that's going to rise, that percentage, it's absolutely clear that the cities are at the heart of this story. Not to deny the importance of deforestation, that's of course the fundamental, and the soils and the oceans, but it's quite clear that the cities are at the centre of um, this story. So we can do this transformation of our cities well, we can do it badly, and that in large measure will determine our, f our future. So our decisions, our 
of city governments, the talents of whether our designers and architects, what people look for in terms of the way of life in cities are all going to combine to determine how well we do. And that's much of, I understand it, of what Ashton uh, does. The uh, cities will be full of opportunities. There are great creators and innovators. We can make them much more efficient, much uh, quieter, much less congested, much less polluted be much more healthy methods of walking around and cycling uh, around, all kinds of opportunities. So when we think about reducing emissions in cities, we're talking about actually increasing well-being and productivity in cities by building much better places to uh, be. Cities are well placed to uh, make those innovations. After all, cities are there because they're efficient because people get together so that they can trade and exchange uh, in a way that doesn't involve too much uh, transport, where interconnections are very important. Uh, cities are places where people innovate and create. Cities are places which attract the most dynamic and creative people. That's been true right across history. So they are not only the places where things have to happen, they're also the places where things naturally do happen. Indeed, in large measure, that's the purpose of cities. And you can set forward attractive um, virtuous cycles or indeed vicious cycles in, in cities. If you ever tried to, as a, as a mayor or a governor of Amsterdam, to disrupt the interests of cyclists, you'd be in deep political trouble. You would too in Copenhagen. What you do as you start to move is you create new constituencies for action. So once you get these things going, and this is a reason for optimism, once you start these political processes, it's quite possible for them to move um, very quickly. Now let me turn to uh, health. Now I've already said that there are lots about in this story around people being much more active and moving around uh, on bikes and uh, on foot, and that's a much more healthy way of living. That's all very well, but if it's a big mistake to breathe, then perhaps that's not such a good idea. When I was at, in Beijing last March, there was a warning that said old people and children should stay in and not exercise very much. Um, I, it turned out that their definition of old people included me, so uh, I was rather taken uh, by this warning. And then I flew from China to Delhi, and Delhi was twice as bad. But at that point, the PM 2.5 in Delhi was sufficient to have shut the schools in China. 13 of the most polluted cities are in India, not one of them in China. Yet we always think about China. And because China's very bad, but we shouldn't think that it's the worst. It absolutely isn't. Not even one in the top 20 the most polluted cities is in China. And there's a Berkeley Earth study very recently that drew attention to uh, the uh, air quality in most Chinese cities uh, was equivalent to smoking 40 cigarettes a day child, woman and man. The children never recover. The damage done to the lungs is permanent on the whole. It is quite extraordinary and Delhi is much worse. In the UK we probably kill of the order of 30,000 a year through air pollution. We kill 1,700 in road accidents. 4,000 people a day die in China from air pollution. It's probably six or 7,000 a day or even more in India. These numbers are just colossal. Just colossal. The Evening Standard quite rightly runs on the front page if some poor cyclist is crushed under the wheel of a lorry. And it's very good that they do. It matters. But it also matters that uh, we're probably killing 10,000 a year in London from air pollution and 4,000 a day in China and a lot more in India. These are extraordinarily important and we've discovered in the last five or six years we've started to get some feel on those numbers. And they really matter, and they've started to change the debate in China. So they're very bad because they describe a reality that is truly tragic. But at the same time, they have been part of the momentum that started to change the politics of China. I believe that it will start to change the politics in India, It'll take a little longer, and uh, they should be changing the politics uh, across the world because these things are not confined just to emerging markets and developing countries. It's the PM 2.5 and smaller. The smaller the particles, the more problem they cause because 
They get through your nostrils and your tonsils and through into your lungs and into the bloodstream. The stuff you can see is nasty, but it's not the big problem. The big problem is the stuff you can't see. You can feel it when you breathe, but you can't uh, see it. And that is a, uh, uh, something that we've discovered really as a world over the last um, uh, five or ten years, as we've seen much more satellite observation of where the PM2.5 is. And it's all over the east coast of China. It's not just in Chinese cities. Because it's light, it gets blown around. And that's true, of course, in places where the pollution is still worse than China. Now, um, it's very important then, if you're talking about the cost of burning fossil fuels, to take into account that uh, effect. The IMF, uh, actually it was one of my students that was prominent in that work, but the IMF in, in March this year published a very interesting, important study of subsidies. They said there's the direct subsidies on fossil fuel, um, to production and consumption, and those are about 500, 600 billions a year. But they're the indirect subsidies through allowing people to do things that are very costly, allowing them to do that for nothing. If you fly tip and dump rubbish in the street, you would consider that, and you give people the right to do that, uh, not, they don't have to apply the labour to take it away, you'd call that a subsidy. I would call that a subsidy. This is the same thing that we've got here, that you're recognising that people are imposing very large costs on other people for nothing. So that's a big part, and indeed it's the major part of the story of the IMF coming up with over $5 trillion a year. That's, that's about 6.5% of world GDP is fossil fuel subsidy. It's enormous if you take into account both the climate cost and the uh, health cost. So that is uh, increasingly recognised through the satellite observation, through the epidemiology that's been coming through over the last uh, uh, few years. This is something that's very different from Copenhagen. This was not in the headlines six years ago because we didn't know enough about it. We do now know enough about it. It's a vital area for more research. We have to know a lot more, but we can already see that this is very large indeed. So you've got these two things together, climate change killing people in the longer term and air pollution killing people now on a very big scale. So that's the, uh, that's the story. Let me, uh, and it's changed the politics in China. It's of fundamental importance to this whole thing. We have to build it really into our understanding of what we have to do. But of course the great thing is if you stop burning fossil fuels, then you stop emitting the CO2 and you stop emitting the uh, air pollution. Not much point in agonising which one is worse, they're both very bad and you get uh, uh, two for the price of one from being sensible and you get much more attractive ways to live as well. I, I think that comes under the heading of a no-brainer. Uh, but it's making it happen. Making it happen. The argument is overwhelming, but the doing involves radical change. It involves ideas, innovation, it involves finance, it involves investment. And that's the kind of story that should be right at the centre of what we do, and increasingly it is. So let me just spend a, a, a um, couple of minutes on Paris. Paris talks about four pillars. It's all very Cartesian. You know, you've heard of, you go into sort of a, a French formal lecture, and j'ai quatre points, and what they've got is uh, four pillars. And the first one is the agreement itself, the text. The text is what everybody haggles over, have been haggling over, because they prepared reasonably well. They started in, um, they got underway really with the text in Lima last year at COP20. But there's all sorts of arguments and square brackets and things you leave in and take out. And there's a whole subculture about you know, people having very intense argument about clause one point something, and then the second set of square brackets. Because they, how you do things, how you share your numbers, how the numbers are verified, when you come back to meet again, do you have a long-term goal in the text? All this is part of the story. But that will be an international agreement. That will be binding. It will be binding in terms of setting the ways in which you do the measurement. You have the measurement uh, checked, how you run the discussions for ramping up and so on. That will be a legally binding agreement in the sense of a formal sense of international agreement where you say that's what you'll do. And uh, it's very important it's an agreement. It's not a treaty or a protocol. 
those words are absolutely off limits because if it's a treaty or a protocol, it has to go to the US Senate and no one in their right mind wants to go there. So um, it, it will be an agreement. Um, that's been clear for a while, but that language is important. The second thing is the intended nationally determined contributions. I've already spoken about those. Each country has put in and uh, 170 or so covering more than 90% of emissions. And I've already said that that's a major step forward, a lot better than business as usual, very good that they've come together, but uh, too high. Those are not legally binding, but they're credible in my view. If you look, very big difference between binding and credible. Yeah? The uh, binding actually in the past was not credible. Kyoto had binding things and the punishment for doing too much during this first phase would be that you'd have to do a lot more in the second phase. Canada went way beyond what they said they'd do in the first phase, so when the second phase came around they walked. So the, the, they really were not, Kyoto sanctions were not binding in any sensible sense. So people confuse binding and credible, I think. But if you look at what people promised to do in Copenhagen and Cancun, in large measure they've done it. If you look at China, if you look at the United States, if you look at uh, Europe, that's been the case. So I do think that these are credible. So don't confuse binding and credible. And sometimes if it is articulated as binding, it may not be credible. And of course, the harder the language you use, the less people are ready to come forward with their ideas. Also constrains creativity. The third thing is uh, finance and technology. The third pillar sometimes mostly finance, sometimes finance and technology. That will be coalitions and agreements, people making promises, but not part of the formal written agreement, but very important sets of promises and intentions around the agreement. And the fourth part will be the so-called action agenda. It's rather a catch-all phrase, but it's very important. And that's about the cities and businesses describing what they're going to do. And you're going to hear a lot of serious and what I think will be credible uh, promises. So that's the subject matter. That's what it will look like. If you say what are you discussing, that's what they're discussing. So the last thing that I have is really why Paris is not Copenhagen. Those are the four pillars, yeah? Copenhagen was cold, it was chaotic, it was quarrelsome. How many people were at Copenhagen? There you see, that's a higher proportion than most of you. You know all about about, about this. It was very badly prepared. There were some secret texts under the mattress. There were other texts that uh, were uh, out in the open. It was really quarrelsome, deep mistrust uh, everywhere. It was also chaotic, queuing for hours in the cold to get in. That doesn't do much for your mood. And, uh, um, but basically, uh, the atmospherics were bad. The preparation was bad. The United States and China were dancing around each other. The Chinese 12th plan hadn't quite been finished. They wouldn't want to promise because they hadn't really sorted out the 12th plan. This is six years on from Copenhagen and the 13th five-year plan is virtually finished. So there's a very different kind of atmospherics, much better timing. A year ago, President Xi Jinping and Obama got together in November in Beijing and they jointly articulated what they would be offering for the Paris Agreement. It was a very staged but importantly staged um, uh, moment. So the atmosphere, the preparation is very different. And above all, the understanding that this is no longer a horse race between climate on the one hand, responsibility and growth on the other. We're seeing much better now and we did this report, Better Growth, Better Climate, a year ago um, with the, um, the Global Commission on Economy and Climate which tried to set that out. And on top of that, you've got people understanding the pollution argument much better. So the politics is easier. The argument now that you can have better growth and better climate, indeed you have to have better growth and better climate together, is much uh, clearer. And the pollution arguments are much more out in the open. All reasons why we have a much better chance than before. I've already mentioned that you're going to have the pleasure, it, were you so strong in your... Uh, um, ability to hold your attention, you'd, you'd have 139, lots of three minutes. Um, I'm told that in the Rio conference in 1992, Fidel Castro actually did stick to three minutes. Um, most people would be expecting eight hours, but, the, uh, but even so, it's going to be a strange beginning. But the idea was to bring them at the beginning, so they tell their people, you get on with it, you sort it out. Last time they went at the end, 
and everything was held back in this quarrelsome act from Copenhagen and uh, Obama um, and all the others uh, uh, got off the uh, plane to discover that their people hadn't produced anything very much and they were working on bits of paper themselves right at the last minute and the chaos was unbelievable so they decided to have the president's prime minister at the beginning to tell the people to get on with it don't you come home without an agreement should be the uh, message I hope it uh, I hope it will. So that's the story. The test of success is basically how good is the story of the ramp up after Paris. Paris is a turning point. It'll set a new road. That's very much worth having. But the bigger test is, are we credible about accelerating down that road? I hope so, but that's what will really matter. Thanks very much.